Good morning, Shelter Rock. My name is Pastor Eddie, and I'm one of the pastors on staff. Would you remain standing for the reading of God's Word? Matthew chapter 22, verses 15 through 21. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay imperial tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They bought him a Daenerys. And he asked them, Whose image is this? And whose inscription? Caesar, they replied. Then he said to them, So give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. And now from 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 5 through 7. They said to him, You are old, and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. But when they said, Give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord told him, Listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. This is the word of the Lord. Well, thanks so much, Pastor Eddie, and hello to my Shelter Rock Church family. If we haven't met, my name is Henry, and I'm one of our pastors on staff. And uh, I just want to take a moment and acknowledge that we're doing something a little bit different today with our Sunday sermon. On most Sundays at, mo at all of our campuses on any given week, you're going to visit and be there and worship, and there will be a live preacher, one of our pastors or teachers in the room with you. And yet, from time to time, we decide to use technology to bring our entire church under one teaching at one time. And this just so happens to be one of those Sundays. So if you're our guest this morning, just know if you come back next week, it'll be different. There'll be a flesh and blood preacher in the room. Well, we decided that this Sunday, being the Sunday before Election Tuesday, would be an appropriate time for us to unite our hearts as the church, as the people of God, and come under the authority and word of God together. You know, Shelter Rock Church is a diverse community. And I'm guessing on, in this room, in your room, wherever you are, just maybe like look to your left, look to your right. You're going to see someone there, whether you know it or not, who is on the left or who is on the right. And it may surprise you to know that if you got into a political conversation with the person beside you, that you were just worshiping with a moment ago. Like, like you, you might be a little bit uncomfortable or unsettled by the diversity of thought in this room. You know what, I just want to normalize that for us. We are a diverse community with people of all ages and stages of life, with people from various backgrounds and perspectives and on a various journey of their spiritual life. And when it comes to politics, we're all in various stages of sort of thinking through and praying through and processing what the Bible has to say and how we can live it out in the public sphere. And so today what we're going to do is I mean, I'm not going to tell you like where you should move. Should you move to the left or move to the right? And we're not going to go through different policy positions from different politicians and advocate and encourage you to move in one direction or the other. We really believe this is a matter that is uh, to be done prayerfully, to be done personally, to be done privately, to be filtered through a biblical and theological lens and that you should uh, vote your convictions and vote your conscience after having done all of this research and all of this prayer and all of this work. But instead today what we are going to do is we're going to invite you, no matter who you are, no matter where you are, no matter where you fall on the continuum, we're going to invite every single one of us to lift our eyes above the, 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 the earth and above the noise and above the sounds and lift our eyes together to the King of Kings and to the Lord of Lords and to fix our gaze on Jesus, the one who reigns and rules above it all. Amen. 
We know that God reigns and rules and that Jesus is right now seated on his throne. So let us fix our eyes to him together. Today, what I want to do is I want to invite us just to fix our eyes on Jesus because we are an eschatological community. And that's what we're exploring today is like in our series, Let the Church Be the Church, what does it mean to be an eschatological community? Uh, The word eschatological comes from the Greek word eschaton, which means last things. And we know that an eschatological community is a community that is focused not on the thing in front of us only in the present, but a community that has a vision and a view and an understanding of the movement of God through all history and how God is orchestrating all things together to accomplish his purposes in the world. And that in our world, not only does God have the first word, but he has the last word. And so we as his people, we lift our eyes above every earthly ruler, every earthly nature, every earthly king, every earthly kingdom, and we lift our eyes to the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And so what I want to do today is just invite us again to fix our eyes on Jesus and to look at four things. To look at four things as we think about who Jesus is and how we can unite our gaze on him together. First, I want us to see where Jesus sits. See where Jesus sits. He's seated on his throne right now. Uh, Secondly, I want us to hear what Jesus says. To hear what Jesus says. We're going to pray that God gives us all ears to hear his voice today. Third, I want to invite us to pray how Jesus prays. I hope you've been praying through this uh, political season and as we go through various things in life, but I want us to pray together and consider the prayer that Jesus teaches us to pray. And lastly, I want to invite us to do what Jesus does. As we fix our eyes on him to see where he sits, to hear what he says, to pray as he prays. And to do as he does. First, I want to invite us to look and see where Jesus sits. A lot of different places we could go in scripture, but I want to go right to the end, to the book of Revelation. And I want to look at the vision that Jesus gives John. His revelation of who he is reigning and ruling above all. It says this, uh, after this, John says, I looked and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And he goes through a vast description of this person, of the throne, and everything that was there. But then he says, in the center, around the throne, were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around. Even its wings, day, uh, even under its wings, and day and night, they never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. This vision of the throne room of heaven and the king of kings seated on his throne. And it's amazing to me that there are these creatures, four different creatures, living creatures with eyes all over them. Eyes in the front, eyes in the back. And it begs the question, why would these creatures have all of these eyes in the presence of God? And it would be so that they could always see. That they would always have eyes to see he who is seated on the throne. We know that Jesus came and lived among us, that he entered into our world, that he lived the perfect life you and I could never live, that he ultimately died the death that we deserve. But the story doesn't end there because he was raised again three days later and 40 days later ascended to God's throne where he is right now seated at the right hand of the Father, a position of prominence, a position of honor, a position of authority. That he is the one who rules over all. Daniel 2 says nations rise and nations fall. But we know Jesus remains seated over all. In our own country, there's a transfer of power that's likely going to take place in the next few days. Um, Lord willing, over the next few months, there's sort of a, a peaceful transfer of power. We're going to trust God in that process. But no matter what happens, no matter who comes into office or who stays into office, or no matter what the outcome We know that Jesus is seated on his throne. 
that Jesus has no term limits, that he knows no term limits, that nations will rise and fall, presidents will come and go, but Jesus is seated on his throne forever. And I love what the four creatures say. They say he is the one who is and who was and who is to come, past, present, and future. He's got it all in the palm of his hands. You might think of it like this. You know, you ever been to Manhattan in Rockefeller Center? There's, um, there's a statue there, a very famous statue of, of Atlas. And if you go to Rockefeller Center and you see this statue of Atlas, you see this, this image of this titan carrying the world on his shoulders. And in Greek mythology, Atlas was, was punished by the gods, condemned to be able to hold the sky and the heavens and all the world on his shoulders. And if you go to Rockefeller Center and you see the statue of Atlas, he is feeling the weight and the burden of the whole world on his back. But you know, right across the street from Rockefeller Center is St. Patrick's Cathedral. And I read this uh, in a book years ago and actually heard a preacher talk about the, the contrast that's here. Because out on the street on Fifth Avenue, you've got Atlas carrying the weight of the world on his shoulders. But what's interesting is right across the street, Fifth Avenue, if you leave Rockefeller Center and you cross the street, you'll enter St. Patrick's Cathedral. And when you go into St. Patrick's Cathedral, all the way in the front, all the way by the altar, there's this small statue of Jesus. And it's, it's like seven or eight-year-old Jesus. It's like child Jesus. And you can't really see it very well, but if you get closer, you look and you see at his hand, he's holding like a circle there. And you can see that there's a globe in his hand. He's holding the world in his hands. Outside Fifth Avenue, across the street, Rockefeller Center, Atlas is weighted down by the world on his shoulders, but inside... Inside the church of Jesus Christ, little baby Jesus effortlessly holding the world and everything and everyone in it in the palm of his hands. And it presents quite a contrast for us, doesn't it, right? Like, like man outside holding the world up on his shoulders, being weighed down, and yet inside Jesus holding the world in the palm of his hands. You know, I love that that this statue depicts Jesus as a child. Because when we read in Isaiah 9, 6, the prophecy, it says, for unto us a child is given, unto us a son is born. And it says that he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And Isaiah then says, we usually stop here, but the very next line says, and the government will rest on his shoulders. You know, the hope of the world doesn't rest on human shoulders or in human hands. No, it rests in the hands and in the arms and on the back of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the one who is right now seated on his throne. We can rest. We can have confidence. We can have assurance that no matter what happens this week, the sky's not going to fall because Jesus reigns and rules. Let us together see where Jesus sits. Secondly, not only do I want us to see where Jesus sits, I want us to hear what Jesus says. Hear what Jesus says. Uh, Pastor Eddie read earlier from the book of Matthew, uh, chapter 22. Fascinating story, fascinating account of two different groups that come to trap Jesus. And what they're actually trying to do is they're trying to, like, they're trying to see which side is he, is he on. Let me show you. The text opens. Uh, it says, Then the Pharisees uh, went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Now, we gloss over this, right? We're in the 21st century, 2024, on Long Island. We miss what the early listeners would have intuited right away. The Pharisees? The Herodians? What are these two groups of people? <laughs> who are on opposite ends of the political spectrum doing together, right? The Pharisees had a particular view as it came to this question they were about to ask Jesus. The Pharisees were anti-Rome. And when they're asking this question about whether or not we should pay the imperial tax or the Roman tax, the Pharisees had a position on that. They thought we should not pay this tax. 
They thought um, that, that they were anti-Rome, and if you were to pay this tax, it was pledging allegiance to Rome in some way, and it was being unfaithful as a Jewish person, unfaithful and disloyal to God. On the other end of the, the, of the, spirit, of the political spectrum are the Herodians. Where the Pharisees were, were anti-Rome, the Herodians were pro-Rome. They thought we should pay this tax. We should uh, work with Rome. We should cooperate with Rome because Rome is going to help the Jewish people expand their dominion and their rule and their reign. So you have this question of whether or not the tax should be paid to the Rome. You have two groups of Jewish people on opposite side of this political question. And somehow these two people who are on opposite sides say, you know what, let's come together. And let's come together and pose this question to Jesus to see which side is he on. Are you with us or are you with them? Are you on this side or are you on that side? This is what's happening in this. It would be as if someone came to Jesus today and a Republican and a Democrat, someone on the left and someone on the right, someone on the far left and the far right came together and asked Jesus, what side are you on on this particular issue. And what Jesus does is, is amazing. What Jesus does is fascinating. What Jesus does is actually instructive for you and for me. Right? They ask Jesus, tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Yes or no? <laughs> right or left? Black or white? Tell us, where are you today? Instead, Jesus he doesn't answer their question the way they expect. He doesn't answer their question the way they'd hope. Instead, he says, show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius. Now, a denarius was about a day's wage. It's fascinating to me. It's a sermon for a different time. Like, Jesus didn't even have a coin. His disciples didn't have a coin. Like, he had to ask for someone to bring him that coin. And he gets the coin and he looks at the coin and he presents the coin to them and he asks, whose image is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Two words that are really important. There's, a, there's an image on the coin and there's an inscription. The image is of Caesar, right? It's of Caesar, the Caesar who was reigning and ruling. But there was, a, there was an inscription underneath which referred to Caesar as a divine leader, a divine ruler, one who has been appointed by God and actually reigns sort of like on a sovereign level with God, the savior of the world. This is, what, this is how Caesar wanted the people of Rome to think of him. And Jesus says, give me the coin. Let's look at it closely. And rather than, rather than like adopting one of their either or categories, rather than taking a position of us or them. Jesus does something. Number one, he refuses to be identified with either of these preconcept, uh, preconceived categories that they already have. He says, hey, those two categories that you have, I don't fit neatly into either one of those boxes. So he refuses to be forced into one side or the other, which is interesting. And the second thing he does is he causes both groups to dig deeper beyond their political perspective and their personal opinion. He moves deeper into their heart to the question of devotion, right? He's asking them to examine what it is they're actually giving to Caesar. And he says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, right? He's the ruler. Uh, we live in Rome. We're under Roman occupation. We are to be subject to our ruling and governing authorities, right? We're to honor them. We're to respect them. Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and yet he also places a limitation on the rule and reign of Caesar. He says everything Caesar's asking for uh, to be seen as divine, your ultimate allegiance, your worship, your heart, your life, don't give that to Caesar. Instead, give that to God. And he says to them and he says to us, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. But make sure you reserve for God that which only belongs to God. Does that make sense? I, I'll put it in like modern day language. If Jesus were speaking today, if I were to paraphrase sort of in, a, in an American 21st century political context, he might say something like, if you see it as your civic responsibility to go out and vote, then go out and cast your vote. Cast your vote. Cast your vote after you've prayed. Pa cast your vote after you've processed. Cast your vote after you've consulted with others with wisdom. Cast your vote after you've really like reflected on the scriptures and the teaching of God's word and the whole counsel of scripture. Cast your vote, uh, ca you know, 
let your voice be heard in this process. Cast your vote, but don't cast your hopes. <laughs> don't put your ultimate trust, your ultimate faith, your ultimate allegiance in any earthly ruler. Give to Caesar what is Caesar, but give to God what is God's. I think there's a lot of us that need to hear that today as we walk into the polling booth this week to know that we may cast a vote, but we're not going to cast our hope, not as God's people. No, no, no. Let the church be the church. We understand the limitations of every human ruler and every human authority. We know the one who rises and reigns and rules above them all. Our ultimate allegiance is pledged to him and to him alone. Cast your vote, not your hopes. Give unto Caesar what is Caesar. Give unto God what is God's. That's the second thing. We're going to see where Jesus sits. We're going to hear what Jesus said. Third, we're going to pray how Jesus prays. This also from the book of Matthew. Uh, Jesus is teaching his disciples how to pray. It's the Lord's Prayer. It's the Our Father. We've been taught it. We've been instructed in it. We've, we've recited it. I mean, as, a, as a church, we've preached on it. Many of you have it memorized. But I'll tell you what, I just want to take a moment and just look closely at the center part of the Lord's Prayer that Jesus teaches us to pray. He says, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus wants us to lift our eyes to the King of kings and the Lord of lords and to know that when we pray to God, we're praying to our Father in heaven. A Father who cares for us, a Father who loves us, a Father who knows what's best for us, a Father who is benevolent and beneficent uh, toward us, a Father who uh, sent his Son into the world to be an atoning sacrifice for us, a Father who has gone through great lengths to reconcile us back to him now and to all eternity. This is our Father in heaven. So he's our father. He's our dad. He loves us. He knows us and he knows what we need. But he's also our father in heaven. He's the one who reigns and rules over all the earth. And he says we are to approach him with this heart posture in a way that, that first, notice these requests, Lord, hallowed be your name. It's not the name of any politician, not the name of any political party, not, not the name of any human individual. No, no, like first and foremost, God, we want our hearts to be so obsessed with your name and your name alone being made great in the earth. And that's a good prayer for us this week. Like God, no matter who takes office, no matter what happens, no matter what transpires, God, we want your name to be made great on the earth. We want your name to be hallowed over all the earth. God, we don't want people to look to individuals or to parties or to platforms or to even any other nation. We want your name to be made famous in all the earth. Every tribe, every tongue, every people group that they might know your name. It's a good prayer for us this week. It's a good prayer. The very next line is that he says, your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. He's praying and he's teaching us to pray, no matter what nation state we belong to, to pray that God's kingdom would ultimately come and reign and rule. And we know that we should never confuse or conflate any earthly kingdom or any nation state with the kingdom of God. It's something altogether separate. Right? It's something that includes every tribe and every tongue and every people and every nationality from, from all around the globe. We go to Revelation 7 and show you that. But here you have a vision for the kingdom which is cosmic and global and multi-ethnic and multicultural and multinational in its scope. And he's saying to God's people, to the disciples, I want you to be so obsessed with seeing my kingdom come and my will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This week I want to invite you to pray for those who are on the ballot, up and down, left and right, all across the board. But Shelter Rock Church, let us, let us pray first and foremost that God's kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. You know, uh, Pastor Eddie read earlier from, uh, from 1 Samuel chapter 8. And I think we see in 1 Samuel chapter 8 the tendency of every human heart. They had God as their king. He was the one who rescued them. He was the one who ransomed them. He was the one who brought them out of Pharaoh and out of Egypt. He was the one who was leading them by day and by night. They had God with them. 
And yet, they go to Samuel and they say, I think we actually want a king like the other nations have. And Samuel's disheartened. He's displeased and he brings it to God. And I, they say, give us a king. And God says to Samuel, he says, give them what they're asking for. And don't take it personally, by the way. They haven't rejected you. They've rejected me. Let's not reject God as our king, the ultimate king, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. As citizens of his kingdom, the church, let us pledge our allegiance ultimately to him and pray as Jesus prays and as Jesus taught us to pray. We're going to see where Jesus sits. We're going we're to hear what Jesus says. We're going to pray as Jesus prays. And finally, I want to invite us to do as Jesus does. Do as Jesus does. Uh, from Mark chapter 12. From Mark chapter 12. And by the way, this is the same passage in Mark chapter 12 uh, where um, Mark records what we read in Matthew earlier about giving unto Caesar what is Caesar and giving unto God what is God. And later on, in that passage, in verse 28, a teacher comes up and they're, uh, they're debating. <laughs> a lot of debating going on back then and now. And they ask Jesus, what is the most important important commandment and he says this he says to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and all your strength and the second is this to love your neighbor as yourself there's no commandment greater than these to love God first and foremost and then to love your neighbor as yourself. And later on when someone says, well, who's my neighbor? Like, who's my neighbor? You mean the person next to me, beside me, right next to me? Uh, the person who lives in my neighborhood and in my community who I go to work with or go to school with? And Jesus said, no, no. I want you to think about your neighbor as the person that you most despise. And he tells a parable of a good Samaritan who came to the aid and the rescue and the help of someone who's on the other side of the track, someone, a social outcast, someone who's been marginalized, someone who's been pushed aside. And he says, I want you to think about the person that you were on the exact opposite side of. And there is your neighbor. Love them. Love them like you love yourself. I actually think this is where the church has an opportunity to be salt and light and an agent of preservation and hope in our world where we get to be a counter witness to all the vitriol and all the animosity and all the anger and all the hatred and all the rhetoric that we hear in our culture today. Let the church be the church. Let our speech be like seasoned with salt. Let us do what Jesus said and do what Jesus does, loving our enemies and praying for those who persecute us. I, I think, I think we got to be a little bit less consumed than we are, a little bit less um, obsessed as we are. We, we, we need to be a, a little less, anim, less animosity than we, we are. We might need to fight a little less than we are. We might need to debate a little more than we are. We need to, might need to listen a little more than we are. Right? We might need to be able to carve some space for those who are different than us or who think differently than us and to think about how we might love them in the same way that Jesus Christ has loved us. Those who were most undeserving, those of us who were most unworthy, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You say, I can't believe this person thinks like this and they would vote like that and they would do this thing. And Jesus says, I want you to love them the way I've loved you. Even as Jesus was being killed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. This heart of compassion, this heart of love, this, this heart for our brothers and sisters and our neighbors, this willingness to see every single person on either side of the ballot or down or left or right as having inherent dignity and value and worth because every one of us are made in God's image. Whose image is this and whose inscription? Maybe we could ask that question about every human being. Whose image is in them? Whose image is in the person beside you? And whose inscription? God's made us in his image, right? In his likeness. Let us love and treat one another with respect. I really think one of the ways the church can be the most countercultural now in a divided world is not only to be united but to be united in our love towards those who are different or who disagree or on the other side of us 
in the same way Jesus has done for us. Shelter Rock Church, this is no tall task. This is no easy uh, thing for us to do, but I really believe that in our time, in our place, in our cultural moment, Jesus is calling us to fix our eyes on him, to see where he sits, to hear what he says, to pray as he prays, to do as he does. The government doesn't rest on any human shoulder. It rests on his shoulders. And we can turn to him and trust to him no matter what happens this week. Be encouraged. Be of good cheer. Jesus reigns and he rules over all. And there may be a transfer of power in our country, but Jesus will remain seated on his throne. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for this truth which anchors us in a way that nothing else can. Nations rise and fall, kings, presidents, they come and go, but you reign and rule ultimately and finally with all authority and all wisdom over all. And there is nothing that can stop your plans. There is nothing that can thwart your purposes. There is nothing that can stop your kingdom from advancing. Jesus, we thank you that we have a hope, an eschatological hope that is not built on what we see, but is grounded in what we cannot see. A hope that is grounded in the person of Jesus Christ and the hope of a resurrection and the hope of a God who reigns and rules and will one day return and wipe away every tear and make everything wrong right again. God, we entrust all these things to you. We ask you to have your way. And no matter what the outcome, that your kingdom would come and your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's in your matchless name we pray. And everyone said, amen. Amen.